My name is Denise Schultz. I'm the director of the New England Women's Policy Initiative, and I'm here today to open up our track on policy solutions for low-wage workers. Um, I'd like to give my colleague Jill Ashton credit for um, helping us coordinate this track. It was super important to both of us that we focus issues around minimum wage and the bills that have been recently, um, the campaigns that have been recently focused on those, and also to fair scheduling, which is a hard issue. Um, to address, and so we're looking forward to both of these conversations this afternoon. Um, I just wanted to introduce our panel. We have Lily from Jobs with Justice here in Massachusetts. <laughs> we have Yesenia Alfaro from Chelsea Collaborative, also here in Massachusetts. We have Georgia Hollister Isman from the Working Family Parties in Rhode Island. And Melissa Bata from Ways, Raise the Wage Coalition in Vermont. And I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello. Oh. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, again, my name is Lily. Um, thank you so much for joining us on the panel today. I'll be moderating, um, and I'll share a little bit about uh, what we worked on here in Massachusetts before I turn it over to the rest of the folks on the panel. Um, so to begin, um, Massachusetts Jobs with Justice is a statewide coalition of unions, community groups, faith groups, and students groups uh, fighting to defend workers' rights, immigrant rights, and public education here in Massachusetts. We are also part of a bigger coalition um, and sit on the steering committee of Raise Up Massachusetts Coalition. Um, and in the past couple of years, we've won really important fights like raising the minimum wage um, to first $11 an hour and winning earned sick time here in Massachusetts. We've also had countless direct actions, worker outreach, um, in-district meetings and protests on corporations like McDonald's and Applebee's um, across Massachusetts from Boston to Springfield. And this past year, uh, we worked on collecting all together more than 300,000 300, signatures, 350,000 signatures um, from voters across Massachusetts who wanted to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, who wanted to win pay family medical leave for workers across the state, and also um, what was the millionaire's tax, the fair share amendment, to tax income over a um, million dollars, an extra 4%, and have that revenue go towards public education and public transportation. Um, Jobs of Justice alone collected 17,000 signatures across the state, so we and all of our coalition members um, in Raise Up worked very, very hard um, in trying to win the $15 minimum wage and paid family medical leave in Massachusetts. We lobbied legislators. We had listening sessions um, across the state with legislators and um, community members, impacted folks sharing their stories. And we put a lot of pressure on um, our legislators in the House. This past June, we had what was the grand bargain, the Massachusetts legislator passed a bill that included paid family medical leave and increased the minimum wage to $15 an hour over the next five years. So that is a victory, yes, right? But we also have to recognize that in the end, legislators still brokered a sleazy deal with the business community. What their grand bargain is really is, you know, was a it was a grand bargain for the business community, um, who were, you know, always in, who are, who are always invested in in stripping away working people's protections and rights. Um, what happened was that the legislature decided to eliminate Sunday time and a half for produce and grocery workers and retail workers, which more than 300,000 workers rely on to pay their bills here in Massachusetts. So that's actually money taken away from their paycheck as part of the grand bargain. Um, there's also a small increase in the sub-minimum wage for tipped workers now as part of the grand bargain. It would not have gone as far as our ballot initiative would have, and it wouldn't have gone as far as what we ultimately need, which is eliminating the tipped minimum wage. Um, so they got what they wanted, which was a permanent sales tax holiday. Um, but in the meanwhile, we are building a grassroots movement and we need to continue building power, continue building capacity for our worker centers and community groups and unions 
to fight for a voice on the job, to make sure companies are adhering to the earned sick time law and paid family medical leave, and that workers are being respected on the job. And so I'm going to end there um, because we have a very robust discussioning, uh, discussion to have about you know, the victories we've had across New England, um, the lessons we've learned, and what we can do moving forward to build power across um, New England. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, having us here. And I feel very empowered when I see so many women in the room. This is, you know, um, we are the multitaskers. We are the ones that are also not only doing the work in the trenches, and that we are also having, you know, to take care of our kids for those of us who have kids already and grandkids. So I'm gonna uh, just introduce, you know, the organization that I work for is the Chelsea Collaborative. It's a well-known organization that is uh, in the middle of the city of Chelsea. It's been there since 1988 and is well known for mobilizing massive of community members. And as a, one of the worker center, I will say that we have been engaged uh, in several campaigns that Lily was mentioning here. Uh, the one that I will uh, focus on is the 5415 and how, you know, us as worker center and immigrant worker center got engaged on this. So as we saw a lot of our workers coming to the worker center with wage theft, uh, we saw the need of connecting into uh, something that can make a change. And by, when I say making a change is the living conditions, the living wage, which is not enough the $15, because we know that if you increase the salary, also that there is the rent increase, and we see in our organization coming to us saying, well, my bills got increased, now I have to pay uh, $100 additional, now I got unemployed, I'm an immigrant who has no documents, I am afraid. So I'm just like mentioning some of the scenarios that we see on a daily basis in our organization. So once we see the need of these workers, uh, we saw um, the opportunity to work with other coalitions, such as the, the uh, Job with Justice with the Race Up Massachusetts, and we started to build momentum when uh, there was a, a lot of investment in our uh, social movement, especially on the immigrant workers and uh, as the minority. When I said investment is that these, uh, there were unions, there were, um, there were like financial resources coming in, and our workers were getting the momentum of getting their wages back. So with these huge several rallies, one of them was the AMC Theater, I don't know if you know the AMC Theater right in downtown Boston? Okay, so that theater subcontracted KBS. KBS hired 10 immigrant workers who were cleaning the theater. Uh, they would uh, shut the lights off on them and they would say, you have to clean regardless. They will not provide them with the healthy uh, equipment. They will not provide them with vacuum. They will have to buy everything on their own. And in addition to that, they also needed to uh, wait for the subcontractor to, according to him, get paid by the theater so that he can pay the workers below the minimum wage, mm -hmm. $8.50, when at that time, uh, it was well, $7.50, and at that time it was $8. So we were like, wait a minute, you're doing overtime, you're working from 7 p.m., and then you say you're getting out of 4 a.m., this doesn't add up. And at the same time, you are telling me that you have to buy the equipment, that you have to buy, you have to provide your own vacuum, that you have to bring this big fly, flash flashlight. So all of these scenarios that I'm telling you, so is that you can picture all of this frustration of these workers and at the same time, the need that was there for them. So we came with these coalitions and we started to do the big rally uh, the investment that they made, because we are a grassroots organization, we don't have the, the big financial resources to make this big, huge signs that was like a pork corn and saying, as AMC teeter to pay these workers, doing the leaflet part, uh, having the, work, the workers uh, speaking up, 
we prep them at the grassroots level, we mobilize a lot of other workers that were impacted not only by the theater, but were impacted by not earning uh, the minimum wage. And we tagged them along. The next day, the owner of the KBS was in our organization, say, I need to pay these workers, because otherwise the theater said they're gonna take my contract out. So, and we were like, okay, are you ready to pay them $78,000? Because that's why you own all of them together. The guy was like, no, I only gonna give them what I own. According to him, he only owned the workers $1,000 each. So we said, okay, we're gonna continue to come to the theater until you pay, we went. But it was because we had all of these coalitions behind us. We had all of this momentum that was building up. And at the same time, we were having policies at the legislation level that had hope in our communities. And seeing all of that, uh, on May 1st, which is one of the uh, big rallies that um, my organization that I work for is the lead organizer for the city of Everett East Boston and Chelsea. We utilize that also as a platform to continue to move on into this big legislation uh, that was already at the state level, that it included the signature collection. So we were all at every event. How many of you might remember having like big clipboards coming after you say, can you sign this so the minimum wage can get increased and so we can get six time? So it was pressure that we were strategically trying to put in the legislators. Uh, once that was done and the whole uh, signatures were collected, the May 1st mobilized massive of people that we uh, went to the local McDonald's who were paying workers below the minimum wage. It was at the era that we also wanted to increase the minimum wage for fast food workers. Uh, and also, uh, we stopped by a local bakery with a humongous uh, giant check with the amount of $85,000, which is equal to the amount that he owned to the workers that we had at that time also. So it was like doing all of this strategically uh, grassroots activism to build momentum to to have this happen, finally, we had something there, right? But everything that I had described to you are things that happened, you know, four years, three years, sort of little things like that that our grassroots organization has helped to build on. Now we are feeling that we have been, you know, sort of not being included in some, included in some of the, um, some of the decision making. So when I say that is that now we know that $15 is not enough. $15 uh, is like taking a candy out of a kid now because everything has increased. So there is still inequalities. There is still the need for us to continue to fight for more than that, that just the $15 because the rents that we are seeing is really crazy. The, the, um, the food you can no longer buy uh, with $75, the amount of food that you used to buy. My family is of six, and I remember buying like for a week, well, with the exception I have teenagers, so they eat more than, they eat for twice, <laughs> so they eat more. But uh, my point across is that these workers are family, uh, have families like I have family, like you have families, and you know you can no longer make it with that amount of money. And on top of that is the fear that we have under the current administration that is telling uh, a, or making the workers feel that if you speak up, you are undocumented. So it's bringing also empowering all the hate, empowering all of these uh, people that are, uh, you know, the bosses or the subcontractors who are stealing money from these workers. So our organization with this movement, our hope is that we're gonna continue to uplift the workers who are in the silent majority, the workers who are afraid to speak up because they know that they, at least with, the, this is what they tell me, at least with the $8, I'm bringing something to put food on my table. I'm putting, you know, the rent, and we do respect all of that. So what we are doing is also we're trying to organize our, our community who is already U.S. citizen to become U.S., uh, I mean, who is U.S. resident to become U.S. citizen so that they can also hurt the right to, to vote. 
And, but in total, in all of that, we also have to go make conscious about when we're making this decision, when we ask them to sign the ballots, when we're asking them, can you sign here to make a decision that is also something that they take critically, that how it's gonna impact, because sometimes they will sign it without knowing. Uh, so those are things that I feel that we are responsible for. And uh, we, all of that I just wanna put on the table that uh, we, continue to, we continue to struggle with this immigrant uh, work because grassroots organizing, or organizing overall, especially with uh, protecting the human rights of immigrants who are undocumented, uh, you know, my fellow immigrants like myself, that when we came, when we crossed the border, we didn't cross the border because we wanted to, to come and steal the works that what they saying. We came here for a better life. We came here because our hope is to give back to this country who has given us the opportunity to grow and to be safe and to have, you know, uh, the conditions that we, we deserve a human. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yesenia. Um, thanks for making so many important connections for us um, and talking about how to engage immigrant workers um, in all of our grassroots work. Next, we'll have Melissa from Raise the Wage Coalition in Vermont share um, the struggle in Vermont. Hi there, my name is Melissa Bata. Um, I work with Vermont Interfaith Action, and we are one of um, two organizations that co led. Uh, the movement called Raise the Wage in Vermont for the last two years. Um, we were able to pull together about 36 organizations from across Vermont to help with the coalition. Um, over the last two years, we were able to pass um, a $15 minimum wage bill through the Senate and then the House, and it got to our governor's desk um, in June last year, um, or this just a few months ago, and the governor vetoed it along with like 18 other bills um, and unfortunately um, all the civic engagement work that many of our coalition partners did over the last uh, few months did not result in a new governor but what we have um, been able to do through some of our C4 partners as well as the civic engagement work that the C3 organizations have done is we now have a veto-proof majority house um, it's a slim <laughs> veto-proof majority, especially when it comes to minimum wage work um, in Vermont. We have about 70,000 workers who um, are low-wage workers who do not make enough money to um, s survive. Um, many of them would have to work close to two jobs at minimum wage in order to just afford rent and basic living expenses. Um, I know that this is not uncommon. I'm sure all of you have stories of that as well. Um, and so what our goal is, is to um, try to push the leadership in the House and the Senate to really push back against the governor um, who thinks that he can water down the bill to make it so that the, um, the current minimum wage uh, doesn't come close enough to a liv livable wage soon enough. Um, I know in a lot of the other states that surround Vermont, uh, the fight is the fight for 15 because it's an easy number. Um, it kind of has a nice ring to it. Um, in Vermont, we decided to stay with raise the wage because we recognize that $15 is not, isn't even enough to live off of you know, even if we had it tomorrow, $15 would not be enough um, for livable, uh, to be a livable wage in Vermont. And so we're kind of just saying, this is the bare minimum that we can do, um, and we're gonna continue to push and continue to fight until um, our neighbors have uh, the dignity that they deserve, working as hard as they work to make sure that everyone else's lives are better. So um, that's, that's what we're doing in Vermont. Awesome, thank you so much, Melissa. Um, next, we'll have Georgia from Rhode Island Working Families Party. Sure, the struggle in Rhode Island. Sure, I feel like we're still a little behind the eight ball in Rhode Island. We're very much in the middle of this uh, of this process. So let me just say a bit about, I work for the Working Families Party in Rhode Island, uh, and we, like other folks up here, are an organization focused on economic justice for workers. We're also a political organization, so you'll hear me talk a little bit about um, about uh, winning elections as part of how you move public policy forward. That's just how, how I and we look at the world. And also, it's an extraordinarily important part of how we build momentum um, 
for these, uh, for these pieces of legislation and lots of others. Um, so I'll say a couple things just about the Rhode Island context. Um, the first one is, I'm sorry not also to be in the panel, uh, at least listening to the panel on fair pay, because in um, Rhode Island we, so two years ago we had a very successful campaign to pass an earned sick days bill in, in Rhode Island. Um, and a bunch of people worked together on that. Uh, labor folks, uh, advocates for economic justice, um, advocates on domestic violence issues, lots of women's groups. Um, and it was a very empowering experience for all of us who were part of that. And so we kind of like came together afterwards and we said, all right, that was great. We made like, you know, we gave 100,000 people who never had it before paid sick days, like what's next, right? You get hungry for more. Um, and around the room, uh, some of the folks who sort of came at things primarily from a feminist perspective were thinking about equal pay, um, and some of the folks who came at, at things primarily from a kind of economic justice perspective were thinking about $15 an hour minimum wage, and we had this really one amazing discussion, um, and one very smart person in the room who was not me, but was a woman who's in the room earlier today, uh, said, uh, we should do them together. Like, we should marry these two things. They're not actually separate. Um, one of the reasons why women make less than men do is that a lot of them are, are in really low wage jobs. Um, and one of the reasons why there, that's one of the reasons why there are such disparities. And then also, you can eliminate those disparities at the bottom end of the income spectrum pretty totally if you <laughs> raise the minimum wage. Um, so we have been working together for a year now on two pieces of legislation. One of them is a $15 an hour minimum wage bill, um, and the other one is a fair pay bill, and we sort of always thought the fair pay bill would move first. Uh, it almost did in the last session. It moved through the Senate and then sort of blew up dramatically at the end of the session in the House. Uh, the $15 an hour minimum wage bill is a little bit of a longer term project, in part because legislators and everyone else in Rhode Island thinks about what neighboring states are doing because Rhode Island is so small. So um, everybody wanted to see what happened in Massachusetts. <laughs> uh, so that's definitely a part of how we think about this. Um, so anyway, those two issues are married together and we, and we continue to work on moving them together and we have this really wonderful coalition because of that that includes you know, everybody from the food bank to the women's rights organizations to labor organizations. Um, and I will say that it has been a really interesting, we've had a really interesting, I see my Rhode Island colleagues sitting out here, <laughs> we had a really interesting political climate in Rhode Island. I see one more in the back. Um, in, the last, uh, in the last year, because at the same time that the end of the legislative session, our fair pay bill blew up, uh, we had this political battle that's happened over the last year, which was basically been between a wonderful set of progressive female candidates, some of whom are, are here. There's Rep-elect Liana Kasser and Senator-elect Bridger Valverde there and State Rep Teresa Tanzi just walked in in the back and maybe you'll meet others later on. Um, there's been this battle between some really wonderful progressive candidates and essentially the, the conservative democratic establishment. Um, and I'm happy to report that politically, voters are on the side of the progressive female candidates. They nearly all won their races, they often won them with overwhelming majorities, and I think they would sort of attest to the fact that when you go out and talk to voters about these things, they're like, of course we want fair pay, and like obviously the minimum wage should be $15 an hour, and that, that it, those are widespread mainstream opinions um, in, the voting public in Rhode Island, um, and yet they're sort of seen as like kind of scary prospects in the legislature. So our, our real challenge um, and the way we think about all of our work is to make the sort of voices of, of working people and actually voters in general heard in a real way at the State House on, on these two issues. Um, and that is a real challenge. And a part of it is like a cultural and frankly class challenge. Uh, we had this around paid sick days too. You know, the number of people when I was lobbying for that at the state house who are like, I just don't believe, like they would say, how many people don't have paid sick days? And I would say 40% of Rhode Island workers don't have paid sick days. And they were like, I don't believe that. Uh, and you know, and these, because these were people who had always had paid sick days and their friends had paid sick days and they were, you know, 
they were professional class, you know, middle class folks. That's largely who we have in our legislatures. And I will say with the exception of the people who are public school teachers, uh, we had that problem even with people who were sort of ideologically on our side. Um, so I think just one of the things that I will say as a challenge for us in Rhode Island, and I imagine that it's not unique, is to um, bring the voices of people who are really struggling with these issues into the room in a way that um, legislators really hear them. Uh, so that that's really, I think, I was talking to some folks, like I'm still figuring it out exactly in the new political climate, but I think we have, have a chance of passing the fair pay bill this year. But I also think we have a lot of organizing work to do around both fair pay and 15 um, to make sure that those voices feel um, heard and urgent. And we don't, we don't have the option of putting it on the ballot in Rhode Island, you can't do that. So it has to be a legislative campaign. Yeah, we can't do that in Vermont either. Yeah. Good and bad. <laughs> All right, thank you all for sharing your lessons learned and your campaign um, struggles and victories. Um, it sounds like we have a lot of overarching themes across New England and across the work that we do, um, amplifying the voices of the people affected and talking about who's left out and who our opposition are every day. Um, how to connect our fight for economic justice with other fights um, across uh, the board, how to move and amplify our messaging and our narrative of workers in this economy, um, and how to build strong coalition um, that takes on the legislature, that takes on the governor, um, and that moves people to listen to the stories of workers, and even to have legislation be pushed and um, passed in different states so that other states have uh, a beacon or a light to move towards. Um, so we know that organizing um, for economic justice in our communities is the long-term goal, right? Um, and this, this fight for raising the minimum wage is just a, a step in, in that. Um, so we have a couple of, I have a couple of questions for the panelists and then we'll move on to opening it to the audience. So if you'd like to take a note of a question you'd like to ask our awesome panelists, please do. Um, my first question is, uh, it's a hard question. Um, is to Yesenia. Um, I know many of your, are you ready? I, <laughs> I know many of your members, your immigrant members are produce workers and do work in retail and do work in the grocery stores around um, greater Boston. And so I would like to ask you, how would you describe what happened with the grand bargain to your members? And how are you going to explain when they start losing money now that um, tipped time and, uh, I'm sorry, um, now that um, time and a half has been revoked? So it's a mixture of workers industry that we have and that includes the, the retail. There's very few retail workers that we have. Uh, vast majority is like uh, contracting, um, there are contractors that are subcontractor, subcontracted, and farm workers that are going to, you know, through temp agencies to, to the farms. But to answer your question on that, it will be something that I will, you know, I will say that is something that it, it was decided, it was decided within a whole community, that is not something that they can feel that they were, um, that the organization or that we were at fault. But it's something that it was decided amount a whole uh, the borders, and it's something that I know that is going to be affecting uh, when, uh, with them. So what we are trying to do is now, like with this new uh, group that are forming, is forming in the aspect of fighting for these policies to be fixed. It's like how do we grassroots organizations voices are truly heard because we are not part sometimes of those bargainings that are happening behind uh, uh, us. And there are other people that are negotiating on our behalf. So those are things that I feel that are unfair and that the fault should not be, you know, like uh, on the organizations that were part of collecting the signatures. That is something that we need to hold accountable, those who made those decisions behind doors, behind a community that was uh, asking for something different. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. It's really important um, to make sure that those voices are at the forefront to make sure that 
those decisions aren't made without them. Okay, so my next question is for Melissa. It sounds like um, you all worked very hard um, to win the minimum wage increase in Vermont, but then with the governor's veto, it also sounded like um, many of your partners, the C4 partners and the C3 civic engagement partners were poised and ready to move um, people to fight for candidates um, that would support an increased minimum wage. How were you, how were those partners ready? Was that part of your plan, your campaign plan to engage um, candidates that, you know, were on our, when are on our bigger side for economic justice? And how did y'all as a coalition um, rebound from uh, a loss and then be able to move partners um, back to being re-engaged to fight for raising the minimum wage? Yeah, so um, it, it was no surprise that the governor vetoed the bill. Like, he had been talking about vetoing the bill since he got into office um, back in 2016. So um, we, were, we were not surprised by it. We continued to push for it, continued to fight for it, um, mainly because our, our families need it, um, our community members need it. Um, and we had um, leadership in both the Senate and the House who were behind raising the minimum wage again. Because you know Vermont has just come through um, a process of having the minimum wage be brought up and then tied to inflation. So t this year, um, it was raised to 1050. Um, and then moving forward, it's going to be um, tied to inflation. But we wouldn't get to 15 until something like 2034, 2036, something crazy like that. Um, which in my county, where I live in Washington County in Vermont, um, to rent a one-bedroom apartment at fair market rate, I need a minimum wage of fifteen thirty-six an hour. Now, um, and so yeah, not even close. Um, and so about I would say probably by about February <laughs> this last year, um, the coalition partners who, who were meeting on a weekly basis, we, we pretty much recognized that, okay, yeah, this is going to pass through the Senate. Yeah, we'll probably get it passed through the House. Um, but there's already rumors of the governor vetoing a lot of bills. And so where do we go from here? And so we continued to put a lot of public pressure. We had um, public comments and public hearings that we had record, maybe not record numbers, but we had like quite a few, I mean, something like 80 folks, 70 folks, which in Vermont, when you only have 600,000 people, um, is pretty big um, to get folks out on like a wintry, um, you know, mid-March, mid-April, I can't remember when that was, it seems so long ago now, um, night, especially low-wage workers, right? Because they have public hearings in the middle of the afternoon where professional folks, they are coming off of work and they can just stop by the state house on their way home before they go and have their meal, you know? But for low-wage workers, it's like, I'm still in the middle of my shift. I still have another three to four hours before I get off of work and can go and, like, throw together a sandwich before I pack my kids' lunches and finish the laundry and do all that other stuff that I never have time for because I have to work two and a half jobs. Um, and so... We really, as a coalition, we try to come together and have um, more stories, more narratives in the room. Rights and Democracy was the other co-lead um, on the campaign, and they threw, a, I mean, they did a lot, a lot, a lot of work um, engaging low-income folks. Um, we don't have a lot of union um, workers in Vermont, and so it, we had to basically go out and talk to folks that were making minimum wage, like, one store by one store. And Rights and Democracy did a great job doing that. Um, we also have Kara's in the room um, with um, the network um, of, I, I, we just call it the network, but yeah, against domestic and sexual violence. Um, and um, so we had, we, we had folks from that network, we had voices from, uh, voices for Vermont's children, we had folks from, um, Main Street Alliance to a certain degree. We had some business owners that were weighing in hesitantly. They're like, we know that we need to get there. We need a much broader view of this. And, um, and so I think by the end of the session, what we had decided was that we would each kind of go our own way 
and, um, and do the voter engagement work and the civic engagement work that we can do. Some folks have that C4 capacity, and so they were able to back candidates that are more progressive and would be stronger voices in the State House. Um, other organizations, like um, the one that I'm a part of, Vermont Interfaith Action, we had to do more of the civic engagement piece. So we couldn't necessarily back candidates, but what we did is that we um, worked in areas where we already had congregations, um, where there were some races that were, um, we knew that there were gonna be some some battles for, and we just said, okay, we're gonna try to go out and get as many folks, especially the folks that maybe don't necessarily vote all the time, maybe because they don't have the time, they can't find you know, the sitter, they don't know um, that they can do early ballots, you know, whatever. Um, we're gonna engage those folks and try to get them out um, so that we can see some movement in the direction and talk about the issues that matter most to them, and mainly around uh, making sure that we have livable wages and then um, for us, we, a lot of our coalition partners were also part of the paid family medical leave insurance program that we tried to get started that also passed House and Senate, but then got vetoed by the governor um, as well. So um, we're at a point now where we're just going to be coming back. <laughs> Many of us, uh, I was just making a comment over lunch that um, a lot of my partners, we've just been sleeping the last week and trying to catch up on like you know, cleaning houses and getting our lives back to normal post-campaign post, uh, season. And, um, but we've already started lining up uh, meetings in the next couple of weeks to be regrouping ourselves to see, you know, what's our strategy? And it's gonna have to be a harder strategy. We know that even though we have a veto-proof majority in both the House and the Senate, um, that the governor's not gonna back down. Um, he wants to be able to have a strong win for his constituents and so, um, we really feel like he's going to do everything possible to water down the bills to make sure that it's not going to meet the needs that our, that our families have in the timeline that they need it. Um, and so I think that uh, for us, coalition is key. It's important. We can't just do, no one organization in Vermont has enough people power has enough money power to win this on their own. We have to work together. That is the only way that we will move this issue forward. It's the only way that we will convince um, business owners and community members that when we have, um, when our neighbors are making ends meet and then have a little bit extra, it's gonna go back into their pockets. It's not gonna be, you know, like your businesses aren't gonna fold. You're gonna actually see an increase in your business because people have more money to spend. And so that's, that's where we're trying to go with that. And especially raising um, up the voices of the women in our communities and especially single moms who, you know, like you were saying, Georgia, who are the ones that bear the brunt of it and are the ones that are being left behind in it. So that's where we're at. Thank you, awesome response, thank you. Um, Georgia, I was really, um, you know, it took a moment to think when you were saying that a lot of folks, like maybe listening to the stories in the news or in the legislature, can't actually wrap their minds around that people don't have, um, that people did not have earned sick days at work, right? Um, that maybe their families do or their neighbors do, especially if they're all in a middle class or upper class community, they do, right? So to help us fighting um, for raising the minimum wage um, across New England, I was wondering what kind of like tools um, did y'all use um, to get the message out there? Um, how did you share stories? How did you craft this narrative to, to educate folks that this was the reality that workers face every day? So the gold standard, and I, I'm not going to claim that we achieved this all the time, is, you know, Rhode Island, the, the culture of the state house is a little different. It's, it's very easy in Rhode Island to, like, walk onto the House floor or the Senate floor and talk to your rep. Um, it's not like you make an appointment the way I worked for years in Massachusetts and you like had to make an appointment to talk to your rep in their office. Like it's not like that in Rhode Island. It's intimidating to do that, especially if you have never done it before and you're like, wait, I'm allowed to go in here and just talk to this person. Um, but, you, but you are and that's actually how most people talk to legislators. So if I had my way, every legislator and certainly every powerful legislator, every committee chair who had authority over a bill, every member of the committee, something like that, would talk to someone from their community every week 
who was like, hey man, I don't have sick days. Or it's me, I make the minimum wage, which is just about in Rhode Island to go up to 1010. Um, and so, you know, we got a ways to go. Uh, you, a single person can live on $15 an hour in Rhode Island, but they can live on 1010, um, uh, which it is right now, and then it'd be 1050. Um, so uh, so that's, that's what we aspire to. Uh, we in no way achieve that. Um, what I will say I've learned over the paid sick days campaign and the, and the work we've done on minimum wage is that the statistics are no substitute for that. Um, like I, the story I was telling before where, where a legislator was like, I just don't believe you that 40% of people <laughs> don't have paid sick days. Uh, that's, I find that that's not uncommon. That like I think we all are like, hey, we're really smart about public policy. We've done our research. We have all these facts and figures and we go into hearings or we go to talk to legislators using those and, uh, and they, don't, they don't land. Um, on sick days we had, but, but stories really do. Uh, on sick days, we had a couple of super powerful stories that we used again and again. We had um, a guy who, and again, this relates to how thing, how legislation matters across lines, who lived in Rhode Island uh, and worked in Massachusetts, and Massachusetts had already passed a paid sick days law, uh, and his daughter was attacked by a dog and um, was in a coma for a week. Um, and he was able to sit by her side in the hospital for a week because he worked in Massachusetts and not in Rhode Island. And like he told that story to the, to the House committee, to the Senate committee, to the Speaker of the House, to the Senate president, like again and again and again. And like nobody, um, nobody ignored it. <laughs> um, and we had another, another woman who came out of um, some wonderful organizing work that uh, the Rhode Island Coalition Against Domestic Violence has done, um, who had a story about her uh, struggle to escape an abusive relationship. And she, was, she said, again, to the House Committee, the Senate Committee, the Senate President, the Speaker of the House, like, there is no way I would have been able to leave this relationship had I not had a job that had, in this case, like, safe time. Uh, it saved my life. Um, so I think there, there are no substitutes for those kinds of stories. They're hard to find. Like, it's hard to find people who are, who, are, who are willing to tell those stories and tell them repeatedly and tell them in super intimidating environments. Um, and, but I guess the flip side of that is, you know, while I would love to have every legislator hear from one of their constituents every week, you don't actually need that many of those powerful stories to make an impact. Thank you. So this question um, is for all the panelists um, before we open it up to the audience. Um, so I'll start down from Melissa on. Um, so my question is how, my question is how do your coalitions work in your state and how do you um, build capacity for your member organizations that need it? Um, and how do you build a culture in your coalition that works um, and that feels good for, for the organizations and the unions to take on such a big fight? Um, I know in Massachusetts, our coalition work is very important. And like you said, we can't do it alone. We need to do it together. And like Yesenia said, we need to make sure that affected voices are at the forefront. So again, my question is, um, how does your coalition work? Uh, what are some of the benefits or how do you build capacity for the member organizations that need it? And um, how, yeah, how do we build a strong enough culture of organizing and movement building and social justice ecology that is strong and um, strong enough to take on corporate greed? That's a lot of big questions there. <laughs> how much time do we have left? Um, so, I have to say that I've been organizing in Vermont for seven years now. I'm not originally from um, the area. And a lot of the work that we had done with the Raise the Wage Coalition was made possible because others before me had built the strong ties and the strong bonds. I just kind of walked into it and then was handed it and said, let's run with it. Um, so I can't take the credit for the coalition that was built on my own, even though we are the ones that brought 
everyone to the table to work on this particular issue at this particular moment. But the reason why we were able to do that is because of the general culture in Vermont that has been building over, I would say, the last at least five, 10, 15, 20 years, maybe even longer than that, of just recognizing that no one issue is a silo in and of itself. We can't just work on one issue and think that if we solve this one issue, all these other things are gonna work out, right? Or we can only you know, focus on this one. And so when it came to minimum wage, and, and we still struggle with it, like there are people um, there are organizations that we, while we hear what they are saying and the struggle that they have, we don't know how to incorporate that into the piece of legislation to make it work. And we're still trying to struggle and to get that right. Um, one instance for that is um, when it comes to um, owners of daycare facilities and at-home daycares, like we don't know how to make it work for them. To raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, even if it was like four years from now, God forbid, six years from now, um, that's going to really impact um, folks that have daycare centers in a very significant way. And it's going to impact the families that access those daycare centers. We already don't have enough of those. Um, and so when we're talking about, you know, this particular issue, we're saying, okay, we need to raise the minimum wage because we can't folks can't live on it. But at the same time, you all in the state house need to help, need to talk to us, hear what we're saying, and take our recommendations of how to fix this daycare system too. You know, and so um, we don't have it perfect. <laughs> we're still working on those pieces. Um, you know, another piece is the tip minimum wage. Um, you know, we have it a little bit better than I think folks in Massachusetts have it, but um, you know, we have folks who are working in tip minimum wage positions who are saying we don't want to be tipped anymore. We we just want to get rid of that and have a, you know everyone have the same minimum wage and we just don't do tips. And then there's others that are like I really like my tips because I make really good tips at the place that I work at. You know, but the diner down the road doesn't necessarily make the same amount. So um, so bringing in those folks as well, um, bringing ho in home um, healthcare workers. You know, like. We need to make it very clear that when we raise the minimum wage closer to a livable wage, it doesn't mean that you can cut the services for home health care. It means that you as a state need to raise the standards and you're going to need to put more money into the home health care networks. And so um, it's just making sure that we're listening to all those pieces. I think that's, uh, I'm realizing more and more um, that I need to, I myself need to spend a, more, a lot more time talking to these different coalitions and not just the ones that always come to the table. Because that's what we did the, the last two years is those were at the table, they got a voice. Um, but we're also realizing that others are being left out and we're, we're trying to um, work on a strategy for myself and others at Rights and Democracy and some of the other folks to, um, to reach out a little bit more and make sure that all voices are at the table so that nobody gets left behind. The question is about how you build a strong coalition. Uh, okay. Uh, well, so I, I said this already, but I'll say it again. Um, the coalition that we have around $15 an hour minimum wage and fair pay, too, actually, is way stronger because of the work that we all did together, I think almost everyone in that room, um, around paid sick days. So not that it wasn't a lot of work to put together a working paid sick days coalition, but once you get going and you have some experience of being able to like lean into each other and make decisions together and also hopefully win some things, um, even if they're not everything that you wanted, uh, it's a lot easier to say, yeah, we're gonna like try to do this big ambitious thing. At some point, we're gonna have to sit down with each other and say, okay, we're not gonna get everything that we want out of this, which pieces are we willing to compromise on and, and who's saying no. Um, we do have in, in the coalitions that we work on, they usually have like a, a smaller committee that is tasked with making some like fast decisions. Um, and then, you know, I wish this weren't the case, but the, a lot of these bills in Rhode Island, they get passed in the last week of session. So uh, <laughs> that means that like, you know, we make decisions about what's gonna be and not be in a bill 
this is, I think, horrifying to the broader public, but those of you who work on this will probably not be surprised, like over a trash can on the third floor of the state house in the middle of the night, right? Um, so having some coalition partners who are actually willing to be there so that when that happens, it's not me <coughs> that says, yes, we can change this sentence, but only if you do it this way, right? Um, that it's a couple of people who can be like, all right, what do you think? Can we do this? Should we go back and try this? Um, and we've been, we've been really lucky. And, and it was very important, actually, at the end of the, the session last time, where the speaker actually passed a fair pay bill, but it was a, it was a disaster. Uh, it actually would have moved Rhode Island women back in a number of ways from the fair pay version that we passed in the 1940s. Um, and so there were like six members of the coalition who were sitting in the gallery that night and we were able to like talk to each other and say, okay, this is what we can say about this. And then we were able to march downstairs together and get in front of the TV cameras and be like, this is a disaster for Rhode Island women. Um, and we couldn't have done that if people weren't like putting in the time to be present and if people weren't largely on the same page about the values that we had going into it. And if they weren't there at nine o'clock at night to like look at each other and be like, gut check, we're gonna say this is a disaster, right? Like, <laughs> um, so, uh, so I don't know, those are some things. Those aren't all the things. Um, I guess I'll just say one thing, the, there's a, we are still challenged by, like when people talk about a $15 an hour minimum wage bill, they don't, <coughs> none of us mean a bill that raises the minimum wage to $15 an hour tomorrow, um, although, you know, wish, arguably but. that would be a good idea. Um, <laughs> But we are talking about a, a bill that sets a schedule of pretty sizable minimum wage increases over time. That's what the Massachusetts bill is, that's what the Vermont bill is, that's what our bill is. Um, and there are people who disagree with that strategy. So one of the things that we, have, we are working on in Rhode Island, and I know folks in Massachusetts had to overcome, is the idea that sometimes advocates like and sometimes legislators like to come back every year or every couple of years and like vote for an increase of a like a relatively small increase to keep to keep coming back um, and uh, and so to say we want $15 an hour is not just to say we want $15 an hour, it's to say we're actually going to set out a schedule for minimum wage increases over time, and that's a different strategy than we fight for it every year in the legislature. And I think a much better one because it leaves us free to fight for other things like fair pay and fair scheduling and all the other things that low-income workers need. Um, but. Uh, but that's not a universally held opinion. So it's not just a policy piece, it's, it's kind of a strategy piece. And we're a little bit still in the process of getting everyone who thinks the minimum wage should be higher in Rhode Island on board with it should be higher over a predictable period um, to get to a relatively aggressive goal. Okay, Lily, hope you feel better. <laughs> Okay, so um, I can only speak like for um, one of the nice uh, worker centers that are, are part of the, you know, of the coalition, but as one of those worker centers, I would say that working in a coalition, yes, it is really a, uh, needed and it's really important for us. It's a work that we value a lot because if we wouldn't work on this coalition, we'll be not doing our work community organizing of making policy changes for our communities. So I would say one of the things that it, it does and it did work at the time is that it built momentum, like I mentioned, that a lot of these workers were able to recover wages because there was a, a lot of momentum, but it continues to have a lot of solidarity. And within those um, grassroots you know, uh, levels of bringing this, not in this political or policy languages, uh, JWJ Edwin, who is uh, one of our uh, really great activists who is uh, passing through a moment of help right now, but he made it happen to, a, a, to a, a basic level of understanding for our members. So I think that those are like some of the key uh, components of working on the, on the coalition, that there are members in those coalitions that can uh, help us to bring you know, our grassroots community members 
to understand why it's important to fight for this, uh, you know, these policies to happen. So, in that's all I will say because, like I say, I want just one of those nine worker immigrant worker center. There is other worker centers too that uh, I'm pretty sure that they have their own opinion and uh, the importance of working on this coalition work. But coalitions are important for us, and we value that. All right, thank you. Thank you to the sisters out there for the cough drops. Um, okay, so now we're gonna open it up to audience um, dis uh, questions for the last 15 minutes of the panel. Um, so Denise has a microphone, I see two hands up. Three. Um, okay, um, Marie Francis and then um, the two folks in the middle right here and then the folks in the back. Hello, I want to just say thank you, Lily and Jasenia and Melissa and Georgia, right? Okay, thanks. Um, and I just want to say I deeply honor and respect the work you do, really. Um, and so I'm Marie Francis Rivera. I'm the leader of the Massachusetts Budget Policy Center. And um, as a person and as an organization that deeply cares about these issues, works on researching these issues, I just want to hear from you all how we can be the best partners we can in this work. So. Great question. Does anyone want to take that up? Sure. Uh, um, Mass Budget did some really wonderful research for the Massachusetts $15 an hour minimum wage campaign specifically on... Um, teenage workers, um, and uh, I heard about it at a conference in DC, and I like rushed back to Rhode Island, and I was like, we need these numbers for Rhode Island. Um, because as you can imagine, you know, even when you get people to agree that the minimum wage should be higher, then you start to have these really weird conversations about higher for whom. Um, and there are, there are pressures to carve people out. And, and one of them is always um, to carve out teenagers. Um, and so I can't remember exactly what the numbers were that you guys did in, in Massachusetts, uh, but it prompted me to go back to the similar group we have in Rhode Island and, and ask them to look at how many teenage minimum wage workers are there? Because again, this is a cultural and a class problem. I think a lot of times when, um, when upper middle class people think about minimum wage workers, they're like, oh yeah, I worked for minimum wage for a while when I was in high school, right? Um, and it was like spending money for me, that's how I went to the movie theater, or whatever. Me too, right? Like that's, that is many people's experience. Um, it is far from the universal experience. Um, and so we were able to come up with data in Rhode Island that shows that not only, so first of all, a lot of minimum wage workers are not teenagers. They're not young. They're in the middle of their careers. A big percentage of them have some college education already. So that's one really important piece. And then the other one that we have found super valuable is that when teenagers work in Rhode Island, they are contributing on average, on average, 10% of their family's income. So the money that they make is not a small percentage of what their families are living on. Um, so they're not, I mean, maybe they're using it to go to the movies, but like they're also using it to like buy groceries for their family every week. Um, so that's just one example, but I would say one of the really important roles for research, and then I think it does have to be paired with stories, um, is to say, like, what is the reality in terms of, especially how some of these groups who there will be a push to have carved out of these bills, um, how that, like, what's what's the real what's the real deal? Like, <laughs> how is this really working for for families? Because I, you know, I think people, it's not always what people think. Yeah, um, I would just like to say thank you for mass budget. Uh, Jeremy Thompson and yourself for all of the research that you have done under the subcontracting campaign because it has played a humongous uh, role in, you know, demonstrating the need of having a piece of legislation that, that unfortunately this year did not pass because it was not calling to a session for a vote, but we know that this year it will pass. It is uh, a way that you can continue to contribute so that it highlights the importance that there is a, a, an issue of not having regulations on the subcontracting uh, industry. Awesome, thank you. So I saw a hand at this middle table here, and then I'll have your question, and then I'll also have the uh, person in the teal sweater, and we can maybe take those two questions at once. 
Thanks. Um, so this past election, one of the wonderful things that did happen is that when these issues were brought to the voters, they overwhelmingly, even in red states, voted yes. And so then there's a lot of states where that's not possible, unfortunately. So I wonder if there's a place while all this coalition work is going on and absolutely should be the forefront, to step back and say, can we try to make that happen? Can we try to, and it, that would probably mean amendments to constitutions, but that might be work that's valuable at the same time in parallel, not instead of, but in parallel to try to get more direct um, voter action because voters, I mean, we talk about getting away from the big business and their corporate greed, the best way to do that is to give that power back to the voter. Just. Hi, uh, I'm Mary Avery. I um, lead an organization called Connected Beginnings, and we work with folks who uh, work with families with children birth to five. So amongst those professionals, we work with child care um, providers. And Melissa, I was so excited <laughs> for you to even say ch child care in your conversation because all day when I look up at this sign and I see ensuring economic security for all women and their families, child care is not talked about enough ever. And that minimum on the side of what will allow any parent to go to work of a child with, with a family with children under five and also Many of those child care uh, places offer after school care because many of us work long hours and can't pick even our school age children up at right. three or whatever <laughs> Meshuggah time it would be. Yeah, right. So, or on vacation weeks and things like that. So, what I'm, my point is though also child care workers are horribly under resourced, underpaid, undervalued, Overwork. and never at the table. Yeah. Never at the table. And so um, I'm just throwing that out there that I feel like I'm, I am excited and applauding and thankful for work done on any professional's behalf to make sure they are paid well. I just want to also, when I hear restaurant workers, when I hear grocery store workers, when I hear these different groups and I don't hear childcare, it makes me furious. Because when I also hear the governor of Massachusetts and Mayor Marty Walsh, who I'm sure is not here anymore, <laughs> um, talk about childcare is important because of the workers of tomorrow, that somehow these babies are the workers of tomorrow. No, they are the workers of today. The pa it's just their parents who are the workers of today who are dropping off those babies. So I just want to wedge that in there of please, 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 always end child care. Talk about child care. Thank you. Awesome. Um, does anyone want to take uh, the first question or comment on the second? Coming on the second. About <laughs> childcare workers and the importance in our economy and society. Yeah. You just tapping into something that, yes, it is right. Nobody's talking about it. But at the grassroots level, we see the need because we see uh, it is hitting my house right now. I have to leave. I came late in the afternoon because I have to help my daughter to drop my grandson. And then I have to leave after here so that I can be there on time at three to pick him up so she can continue to do the work. So there is an organization that is Community Labor United right now that is working in putting, tailoring together right now uh, the child care. We at the collaborative, we have received uh, some uh, females who are struggling with, with the vouchers, struggling with, you know, not, not getting enough um, I would say enough money for, for the child. But also, as immigrant workers, there is a lot of undocumented immigrant workers who want to you know, pay uh, or be part of this process of getting the voucher, but they can't. So they have to pay a humongous amount of 100, 180 for a week. So they rather decide to stay at home and not working because they, uh, they say, why am I going to work if all my money is going to go to childcare? So it's like, it's the sport, por, the sport, well, I don't know how to pronounce it, desproporcionado. Yes, 
<laughs> so entonces, uh, so then uh, I would say yes, it is something that we are considering in our organization to, you know, tag along with that coalition of childcare because we know the need is there and uh, truly agree with you that we need to bring it more in the table. Sure, I'll say a quick thing about each of these. Um, one is uh, the ballot question. So I've worked in places that have had ballot questions and places that don't. Um, and it can be a bit of a double-edged sword. It is both a very powerful tool to force um, a political system to pay attention to something. And then also you heard Lily talk about how the legislature St it still mattered who was in the legislature and what their values were about what they were willing to, who they were willing to negotiate with at the end. Um, so, you know, I like, I like having the option of having a ballot question, but I think the, by far the most powerful way in which voters' voices manifest themselves is by, by holding legislators accountable um, and by electing new legislators if they uh, don't do that. Um, and yes, on childcare, and especially I think that it's related at both ends. Like it's, if we're serious about economic justice, especially for women, we have to be serious about, um, about high quality childcare available to everybody at a price they can afford, and we are way far from that. Um, and then if we're serious about a living wage, then states have to be serious about investing in child care workers and home care workers, in disability workers, and by the way, those folks are disproportionately women and disproportionately people of color. Awesome, thank you. So uh, we have another question at the back table with Sister Tess, and then I'll also take um, the gray sweater over here's hand up, um, see if we can answer those both at the same time. It's on. Hi, my name is Jyoti, and I'm trying to organize the South Asian working class community in the Boston area. I uh, have a few uh, questions, and of course, I'm kind of, you know, piggy piggy bang on her statement about childcare. Most of our women workforce are not able to get their hours because they do not have childcare facilities. And the nannies who work in houses, they cannot get their nanny job because Again, they don't have childcare facilities. So how within the South Asian community, they are trying to work it, like there are some family, they are charging $3 an hour and taking care of the child while they are going to work. So these are the issues that I was trying to understand and maybe you know talk with other organization, worker center, how can we work, the, work on these issues together. Uh, the second thing is uh, I was trying to see if any of the worker center is working with the family of taxi drivers because most of our workers uh, that we have been working in this area are taxi drivers who are really paranoid with this change in this you know Uber and Lyft thing coming up. Even when they have the privilege to do both this, you know, Uber, Lyft, and taxi, they still think taxi was much more uh, a stable income coming into the family, and that was much more reliable. And the third question, which I'm, 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 I don't know how to frame it, but on the question of uh, equity and inclusiveness, like South Asians, maybe just 3% of the working class population in Boston, but that 3% is worth paying attention to. Every time I'm, being, I'm kind of talking to the collaboratives that we should be included as a 10th worker center, I, I kind of get a feeling that, you know, South Asians are privileged mm -hmm. class. And, uh, you know, I don't know uh, whether what kind of job they do are going to be taken in. Uh, or be accepted by the other worker center. So talking about the inclusiveness of the other worker center, I'm just trying to put my points across and get some of your views. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, that's a great question. Oh, okay. So you want a second question or yep. you want to answer this? Lily, do you want to answer this? Well, uh, I would like to take the person in the gray sweaters And then question. come back to me? Sure. Okay, thanks. Oh, sir, Sister Tess, did you have a question? Let's just get that one right now before we send Denise over there. So, I'm Tess Brown, and obviously she outed me. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a nun. I'm sister, sister of Charity of Nazareth. I'm a community organizer and um, on the board of Mass Interfaith Worker Justice, um, part of the Raise Up, etc. And as we are talking, I'm wondering too, um, how do we also include or but there's a lot of wealth there in organized religion and around social justice. And so how, can that, how do we also make sure that we, we include that and tap into that, un, uh, sometimes a resource that's not used to the fullest. 
You know, like for instance, with Mass Interfaith Worker Justice, we do labor in the pulpit, in the mosque, in the bima. And so like having workers come to the liturgies on the Sabbath or on, on Fridays or on, on Sundays to speak about what worker issues, we do that. But you know, just that there are things that are out there and I'm wondering if you all have considered or maybe done some work on different ways. We'd like to just hear that too, thanks. Mm, thank you. So, uh, I, uh, sure, why don't uh, Yeah, well, while well, Denise is walking. So, yeah, um, let's take um, gray sweater question okay. and then we will answer. Uh, answer all three. So Chantel is my name, not Gray Sweater. <laughs> but my question is, because I really like the conversation, but I think what we're missing is if we get this minimum wage to go up, right? It's really nice and it sounds really good and it sounds like you're going to bring all this money in. But for those that are on assistance or getting assistance, as soon as they get that $15, they no longer have the assistance that they had because now they're over the amount mm -hmm. that they're ready for. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, how do we change the system? Mm -hmm. Because giving us more money sounds good, but if we can't use the money to actually help further ourselves because it's easier and it's helpful for us to stay home in order to have the child care for us that we don't have to really pay for, to have the health insurance that we need, that we can afford, how do we do that? Because it sounds good to do the $15, but if we don't work on the system that's stopping us from growing, there's no point. So that's my question. That's a really good question. Okay, so just to, we're going to have some folks answer and wrap up the panel, but the questions were around um, domestic workers and taxi workers as um, South Asian workers, religion and faith in action, and how does raising the minimum wage affect um, folks' ability to get a public assistance? No, 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 oh, you're talking about the benefits cliff. How do we, yeah. sorry, how do we confront the system? Yeah. Yep, benefits cliff, cliff. yeah. So um, I can help tackle the last two questions. Um, so as part of Vermont Interfaith Action, one of the reasons why we were asked to be at the table in Vermont is because we do faith-based community organizing. So I'm organizing in churches, synagogues, the mosque up in Vermont, the Baha'i community, the Buddhist communities, and so um, we bring that piece to the table. And one of the, one of the challenges that I've um, put forward to the clergy that I work with is, are you all paying your workers a livable wage? And if you're not, what is the plan? Who are you going to within your congregations to make sure that everyone that you employ is being employed at a livable wage? And, um, you know, because if we're not willing to take that on ourselves, then how can we be asking all these businesses? How can we be asking the state to be doing that as well? Um, in terms of your question, Chanel, right? Chantel, sorry. Um, so that, that's one of... What you raised right there, the benefits cliff, is one of the main reasons why we have been looking at childcare workers so much in Vermont because um, when we did some analysis through the Public Assets Institute in Vermont, um, we realized that with the trajectory that we had um, in the minimum wage bill, um, folks could still be on certain benefits, but the one benefit that would they would drop out the most would be childcare subsidies. Um, the cool thing about it, in Vermont at least, is that, that our state legislatures, legislators could change that policy. They have the ability to, um, to change the way that that's being doled out so that it doesn't have to necessarily be a benefits cliff. They just haven't figured out how to do that yet. And so that's been one of the hangups for us. Um, but it's definitely something that we've been looking at, that we've been monitoring. It's one of the things that makes it so challenging to try to push for a higher livable wage sooner. Um, and it's, it's something that we're continuing looking at, so. Um, so this piece about how uh, the interaction with the various public benefit systems. Um, so first of all, that is a real problem for a small percentage of, of workers. Um, it sometimes gets thrown up as a reason not to do a thing that is good for most low-wage workers, but you still have to fix the problem for the people for whom it it matters the most. Um, 
we've, there's been some really good work in Rhode Island, which I won't claim credit for because I haven't done any of it, um, but to make some of those benefits cliffs into uh, more gradual off-ramps. So as your wage goes up, yes, eventually your benefits go down, but they go down slowly, and that's more than offset by your additional uh, additional wages. Um, that's happened for some benefits and not all of them. So there, it, I think this is a great example of how, like, yeah, like we're working on minimum wage right now, but really what we care about is economic justice, and that means that there are other pieces that you have to be working on as well, and that includes the state budget if you're serious about wages of childcare workers. That includes how you calculate. Um, and disperse benefits in a way that doesn't leave people out in the cold. Um, and it includes a bunch of other things too that we haven't even talked about here. Um, so very real concern, um, and, but also one that sometimes our opponents throw up as sort of a smoke screen to be like, you can't do this. I do feel your frustration because um, like I said, I'm a person that works with vast majority of fellow immigrants like myself from El Salvador. And just like the immigration system is broken since 1965. So I do feel the frustration. And uh, it's something that we need to you know, continue to organize because the formulas are really disproportionate. And in regards to the domestic workers, we are trying to form a co collaboratives of workers through jornaleros and trying to see how we can create that economic uh, source of income because it's like our working class are being exploited and they continue to get exploited, like Uber now, Lyft, and all of that uh, that is growing in the, in, in the industry. Now people are getting, uh, they are en ending up without a job. So uh, I will invite everybody to just, you know, bring those to your organizations and see how we can all collaborate and working in changing those systems. Not only the economic system, but also the immigration system. Because I hear comments like, why are these people in the caravan coming here? Uh, you know, we are coming here because the United States sent a lot of the corporations into our countries. So that's one number one reason, right, why we are here. And the second reason is economically we cannot make it there no more because now we depend a lot in the remesas that our family members are sending here. So in here we are also struggling with that. So it's a vicious circus that we need to tap in and target together so that we can change. Thanks. And I would also echo that I think many of the answers that we are searching for are here, you know, in this room with each other. Um, and we look to each other for inspiration um, and, and strength in organizing. And I think from organizing in ethnic communities like the South Asian community, in workforces like the taxi or Lyft and Uber industry right now, um, the domestic worker groups or childcare workers are organizing in our faith communities, right? Like, we know that raising the minimum wage and winning these things at, um, in, in, in the state house in our states are important, but we need to build the grassroots movement that confronts the systems that are continually oppressing us and change the narrative um, so that we can win on the ground, build policy in the state house, but more importantly, win and organize on the ground as well. So I'm gonna invite Denise to come up and close us up, and the panelists are around if you'd like to ask any questions after. I just wanna say thank you to Lily, Yesenia, Georgia, and Melissa for this great conversation. If we can give them a round of applause. Um, we're staying in this room for the low wage workers track, so fair scheduling is up next. There has been some um, a snack that's been placed in the back of the room. You can maybe get a, a quick snack and a drink and then get back to your seats. We're gonna do a quick change and go right into fair scheduling, so thank you.